Hi everyone. Let's uh, resume our eon topic beyond obscenity where we left yesterday. So where we are. Yeah, so we need to start from here. In this essay, always self-deprecating about his legal education, Ernest often remarked that he was partially trained lawyer and called himself a dilettante. The sense of being dilettante was no doubt connected to his sense of inadequacy of his legal training. While he may have described himself as a half-trained lawyer, other civil libertarians of his generation recognized his talent and his energies. He quickly rose in American Civil Liberty Union to become an executive member and co-general counsel to the national board from 1929 to 1955. The ACLU's post-Second World War commitment to expanding civil liberties across multiple fronts reinforced his free speech ideal. So, this passage is talking about how Ernest get position in American Civil Liberty Units. So the title of this passage is Ernest Positions Ernest Position in American Civil Liberties Union. And how is himself the uh, Anna says that in the first line, it says, Always self-deprecating about his legal education, Ernest often remarked that he was a partially trained lawyer and called himself a dilettante. Dilettante, sorry. So, uh, his self-remark make a sense or means uh, his self-remark, self-confident, give him courage or and make him eligible for the part of American Civil Liberty. Here, here is also mentioned, while he may have described himself as half-trained lawyer, other civil libertarians of his generation recognize his talent and his energy. So because of his self-remark, he get positioned in American Civil Liberty Union, which is mentioned in both the uh, above sentences. So we can take um, we can uh, point uh, take here is because of his self remark as a partially trained lawyer and dilettante, he got the position in American uh, position of civil executor uh, of executive member and Cook General Counsel in American Civil Liberty Union. So let's move on toward the next series of essays. Ernest bases his anti-censorship campaign in the court as well as in the court of public opinion. So let's see what the first passage hold. Ernest begins laying the intellectual groundwork for a strategy attack on the obscenity law when he underlook a lively historical study of Anglo-American censorship practice titled To the Pure, 1928. His steady piecemeal campaign against the obscenity law was significantly aided by Alexander Lindy who joined GWE in 1925 upon a graduating from New York Law School. Lindy was one of the handful of junior associates in this highly successful Jewish law firm who worked 
alongside Ernest on his censorship cases and helped make GWE the key player in the fighting for sexual liber uh, liberalism in the US courts prior to the Second World War. This passage is saying that how Ernest attracted towards or how Ernest just uh, protested against the obscenity law and how Alexander Lindy helped him in this protest. So the title of this passage is Ernest work for removing obscenity law sorry we can also write that how Ernest got into how Ernest got uh, encouraged to uh, work for obscenity law how Ernest encouraged to work for obscenity law so this says that because of the historical study of anglo-american censorship practice titled the pure the Ernest got his steady piecemeal campaign against obscenity law significantly added by okay because of that book his passion, not his passions, he started a campaign against obscenity law, which is joined by the Alexander Lindy, who is a soon, uh, who is a junior from the New York Law School. Who is a junior from the New York Law School? That's all this business. It's moving toward the next. While the ACLU was deeply involved in promoting what the historian Lee N. Miller described as sex as a civil liberty, Ernest was the architect of deceived trial from the late 1920s to the beginning of the war and his firm did much of the work pro bono, pursuing what Ernest described as rational sex law. GWE took on obscenity law as well as wider culture of Comstocky, which they saw are responsible for irrational sex law over a jealous applications of value 19th century state statues and the unseemly difference accorded to the administrative censorship authority. They did their work on behalf of the many publishers, writers, but birth control activists sex executors, educators, bookstore owners, Bullsquare theater owner and other who ran a fall of those laws. So, uh, so uh, by making this campaign uh, successfully, by running this campaign successfully, ACLU, ACLU organization along with the earnest organizations did the great work by uh, by taking help from the various publishers and writers, birth control activists, and many more who are related to the rational sex law. So, Ernest and so the title of this passage is Ernest and ECLU's campaign against rational sex. So what we can take from here is initially they were much on pro bono.
they un they defends the accord to administrative censorship authority of rational sex law they work on they represent many publishers writers birth control activists sex execute executors bookstore owners against the rational sex law so let's moving toward the next spaces ernest wazed wazed his anti censorship campaign in the court as well as in the court of the public opinion constantly vilifying and brawling in the city's newspaper and magazine with the john sexton sunner or the new york society for the suppressions of vice under suspend years building momentum for the anti censorship cause and garnering allies among those victims by some some now ernest was more pragmatic in the actual court where he defended credible material whose status as obscene was constable he and lindy carefully built their cases and brought in pickable Yaridite legal briefs aimed at persuading judges that the customs and porter, postal authority was seized working with demonstrable value of, to the public. So here, uh, this person is saying that how earnest, how earnest, carefully work and smartly work in this case to make a uh, win. Uh, he smartly present this whole case. in the court not just in the court but in the court of the public opinions because of because everything is so conscious so so what we can say everything is so serious in this things so he he need to be just make everything every note every evidence carefully so that they can won the case which is because uh, the status of obscene was constable so he just want to legalize all these things his aim to persuading the judges that the customs and the portals authority were says work with the demonstrable value of the public that's his main motto of this species so uh the title of this species is earnest work earnest so uh, crucial work toward this uh, obscenity case and we can uh, take the many thing from you is Ernest was pragmatic in the actual court. He defended the credible material whose status as obscene was constable. Brought impeccable legal briefs aims to persuade the judge that the customs and postal authority was seizing work to demonstrate value to the uh, public. So let's moving toward the next places. New York City was a stage for Ernest, an ideal place for him to wage his battle. Not least because Sumner was a great foil who could be held up to the public as the antithesis of the city's cosmopolitanism. Moreover, New York was the center of the U.S. book publishing world, and Sumner. had a much cloth over what publisher could risk publishing that he antagonized the intellectual class he mentioned publishers list warned them he would go after them if they published work he thought were obscene such as olysses itself and often followed though of his threat by the raiding publishers offices bookstores magazines stands all with police and photographers in town 
Ernest easily painted him as an anti-democratic scourge, a censor who was utterly out of touch with the spirit of New York City. Ernest and Sumner shared a deep animus which fed journalists account to their skirmishes. So uh, this thesis is saying that how the New York City plays a great um, important role in Ernest's case. How Ernest just uh, uh, take the help of the publishers because the, the, what the publishers uh, publish that's really affect the whole public and that's really affect this case. So they are warned them that if they would go after them, if they publish work he thought were obscene, such as Olysses itself, more often follow through on his threat by raiding publishers' office, bookstores, and magazine stands with police and the photographers in tow. So uh, he just he and his partner, some know he. They threat the publishers if they go against the options. If they publish anything against the options, so they have the authority. They have the authority to raid their bookstores, offices, and magazine stands with the police and the photographers. So, the title of this passage is Ernest and Sumner's Threat to the Publishers, New York Book Publishers, to go against any kind of, to publish anything against options. That's it for this passage. Because there is much, not much content we can take from that. Let's move in toward the next one. Ernest and Lindy won a claim in a series of high profile cases leading to the defense of policy. They successfully defend the birth control pioneer and sex education pamphlets writer Mary Ware Dennett, which is in the case of US versus Dennett. The birth control's advocate and the sex educators. Mary Stoffe, in the case of U.S. vs. one option book entitled Married Love and U.S. vs. one book entitled Contraception. The novelist Radcliffe Hall and the Margaret Sanger's birth control clinic following a police raid in 1929. Their fight against Comstocri gained a momentum as did their sexual liber liberalism, which emphasized freedom of expression at the expense of obsessive, capricious moralism. They reading read it themselves for their crowning victory. So uh, this passage is saying that there are uh, describing, not just mentioning the various cases related to the birth controls and the sex educations. So, so the passes, uh, the title of this passage is the cases related to the description of the cases related to the birth control and the sex educations. So what we can take there is the first cases defended the birth control pioneer, this one, and the another case is this one, is this one. And other thing mentions about the novelist for the fighting against the Comstockery. And this moving toward the next species. One can usably interpret Ernest's challenge to the obscenity status and their administration as being essentially a parallel free speech movement to the one his ACLU's colleague took up on behalf of political, radical and the labor union in the 1920s and 30s. Free speech was in the air in civil liberties. 
circle and Ernest and Lindy succeeded in part because they effectively mobilized an already available free speech tradition. They gave voice to a body of arguments familiar to Americans across social classes, not just against censorship but on behalf of deeply held ideas about free speech and political liberty. Those ideas gained adherent in the face of rising totalitarian threat in 1930 s and beyond. Even if the First Amendment did not protect all forms of speech and expression, literary censorship in particular came to be understood as anti-modern, anti-intellectual and anti-democratic and this aid the anti-censorship cause. Nazi Germany reveals what an odious practice book burning was and how much it contravent democratic ideals of free speech. So, this passage is talking about the free speech, the tradition of a free speech. The title of this passage is The Tradition of Free Speech. So, uh, we, what we can take here is from the, tradition, uh, from the tradition of free speech, Ernest and Lindy successfully Uh, from the tradition, with the help of traditions of free speech, Ernest and Lindy gave the voice to the body of argument which is familiar to American across the social classes. And because of that speech, they gained adherent in the face of rising totalitarian threat in 1930s and beyond. So that's all for this passage. Let's move in toward the next, which is the last passage of the day. Ernest also effectively rooted his argument about the value of his client's work in the terms of modern democratic theory. The rational, self-determining adult was capable and therefore ought to have access to diverse marketplace of ideas. Adult interest and needs matter in this marketplace. Moreover, the censors and prosecutors' assertions of moral harm to unknown reader were simply inadequate as evident of actual harm. And demonstrating actual harm was crucial as a due process matters in criminal law. The law's assumptions about potential harm to some unknown reader had to be weighed against the potential and actual medical value of contraceptive. Tip or marital value of sex education or intellectual value of modern fiction. So, this passage is saying that Ernest, uh, the motive behind all this, Ernest literally want to work for or yeah, literally want to work for the modern democratic theory, which is about the rational, self-determining, adult, capable and uh, capable. And his, uh, his uh, all the efforts is to uh, protect the moral harm of unknown reader. So uh, that law tells uh, that law, which that obscenity law, 
says that the medical value of the contraceptive or the material value of sex and the intellectual value of modern fiction potentially harm the unknown reader so uh, what we can uh, what the title of this pieces is what obscenity law holds what obscenity law holds so the first one is what we can take from here is potential harm to some unknown reader have to weigh against the potential and actual medical value contraceptive or uh, marital value of sex education or intellectual value of modern fiction so that's all for today let's uh, see you guys tomorrow